Hey guys, this is Ricardo here from the Watch With Us Instagram. I'm here with Spanish Rob, the man. Uh, we were lucky enough to get him in so we could discuss a little, a little more about this recent acquisition of Tiffany and Company. Um, Spanish, how you doing, man? How's it going? Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. Um, I'm really glad to have Ricardo and John Keel running the running the show most of the time. I, I, we don't get to do this split screen thing often enough, but I'm glad we could find some time to do it. I just happen to be in Seattle, Washington, uh, which I'm not from, but I'm just here for the holidays. And I'm excited to talk about everything that's happening. It's such a really, it's a really big deal for a giant conglomerate like LVMH, uh, mega company to take over the top jewelry brand in the world. Like it's just, well, it's, it's huge. There's so many things that we can talk about, but go ahead. So yeah, we're, it's interesting because we're kind of um, coast to coast. I'm over here on the East Coast. He's all the way over on the West Coast. So, I mean, we've just realized, you know what, we have to find some time and talk about this because what Spanish is saying is right. This is a huge deal. And not just a watch deal, just a huge deal overall. So before we just jump into the conversation, of course, let's get that wristwatch check. Let's get that going. What you got on, my friend? So, oh. yeah, I'm yeah. always wearing two, obviously. Um, because I'm, I'm traveling and uh, three time zones away from New York, I have the, uh, the Batman GMT uh, nice. set to local time and the GMT hand to to home time. And then my trusty IWC Galapagos Aqua Timer, which is my perfect beat around all day every watch, you know, cause it's completely covered in rubber and I can't really scratch it or dent it really. And it's just a, a badass, kick ass watch. So I've got on um, my Honeymooner. This was my first ever like Swiss chronograph that I ever purchased on my um, honeymoon. About two days after I got married. Um, it's nice. from a brand called Ernest Burrell, independent brand, but a few years ago they were purchased by a conglomerate. <laughs> Speaking of the Batman, you remind me, we have to sit down and talk about that, that, that bursting of the Rolex bubble whenever we get a chance. But today is LVMH. LVMH. Yeah, I, I definitely saw that video with Adrian uh, from Bargain Jack, and it's really good points. A lot of good homework people did. I don't want to accept it or believe it because I have one and I want to sell mine eventually, <laughs> exactly. so I'm not. I'm going to say you were wrong, sir, but um, <laughs> I think the research is actually pretty right. But uh, I don't want to think it's a burst. I think it's maybe a move in direction, but I digress. Anyway, let's get I back to it. Yeah. Another video, another video. So, of course, um, we're here to talk about the huge news of LVMH purchasing Tiffany & Co. for about $16.2 billion. And the first thing everybody wants to know is why. What was the main reasoning behind this purchase? Is this a watch thing? Is this a jewelry thing? People want to know. What are your thoughts, Rob? Well, it makes a lot of sense because if you look at LVMH's portfolio, LVMH is the biggest. It's bigger than Richemont and Swatch Group and everybody combined because they don't just sell watches. They have five different categories ranging from spirits to leather goods and so on and so forth. So the watches is less than a tenth. It's actually 9% of all the business they do. It's like four or five billion out of the 50 they do. Um, so for them to be so enamored with taking over Tiffany. I think it has to do with the fact that Tiffany is the number one jewelry brand in the world. And it gives the opportunity for LVMH to join the high-end luxury of jewelry sector. They already touched that a little bit by buying Bulgari in 2011, because Bulgari sells jewelry and like really high-end jewelry um, along mm -hmm. with watches. And LVMH has the right tool, set of tools and the right set of, uh, of people or just whatever they, they they make things work they get they acquire brands and make them so successful so tiffany's has been slacking it's been slumming the last couple of years and they mm -hmm. thought they were recession proof they thought that they were the top company in the world. they were and for a very long time they were the only company that could do double digit um increase in profit every year even during the recession in 2008 but then it slowed down in the last few years because the chinese stopped buying and so would a fair for for the the for the layman out there would a fair comparison be that in many ways Tiffany is the Rolex of the jewelry world, brand Tiffany recognition, is. brand name, everyone knows Tiffany when it comes to jewelry. I would say it's like a mix between it's like the paddock of the jewelry world, but the oh. only difference is you're right it is the Rolex of the jewelry world because Rolex makes a lot more watches than paddock, um, yes. and it's more the the mainstream. 
and also the upper echelon. I mean, they're selling billions of dollars worth of diamonds and they're technically the biggest jeweler in the world, but they have brand recognition, which is the most important thing. Great. And LVMH was smart to pay whatever it was. The whole deal had nothing to do with watches. And it's funny that we're talking about it because of the link with Paddock, but the reality is Tiffany's sales is over 90% jewelry. And then the rest is like, you know, accessories and watches and like whatever. Um, it's mostly jewelry. LVMH did this for the jewelry brand and they did this so that their brand, they can get into high-end jewelry. Because right now they don't do high end stuff. They do a lot of gold. They do a lot of other things. And with Bulgari, they started getting into really hot horology and hot uh, jewelry, the really diamond stuff. But buying Tiffany brings them to a completely different level and brings them a part of the portfolio that they didn't have before. So it's almost kind of like a, a mix between the fifth, fifth and a half sector for them. It's like not the sixth, but it's like fifth and a half for them because this is so, a completely different ball game. So for sure we know. Okay, so now we know this was mostly a jewelry move, but of course right. we're watch guys. So the first question I know a lot of people are asking is, what is this going to do for that relationship that Tiffany had with Patek? Because in many ways, Patek is kind of a competitor when it comes to watches at LVMH. So what does that, what does that do? What happens there? It's very interesting. And there's so much to say about this because we have to go back to the relationship between Tiffany and watches, the relationship between Tiffany and Patek, the Tiffany, the relationship that LVMH being a, a behemoth still only has, and they, have, they do so much with their watches and it's only a tiny percentage of theirs. What is it going to do to have jewelry and watches? It'll double their sector of jewelry and watches, even though it's mostly jewelry and they already do mostly watches. Um, but it's going to influence, I think, Tiffany's watch department because of a few different reasons. Um, but we have to go back to Paddock and watches. I mean, Tiffany and watches. Tiffany was... It was a really important retailer of Rolex, of Bon Mercier, of IWC, of Piaget, of a bunch of brands for, you know, decades, many decades. And then about 10 something years ago, they said, okay, well, our Tiffany brand line is not doing well. And they did it. They, they structured a, a contract with Swatch Group to make their watches, produce them and sell them. Um, and Swatch Group, because this is back when Hayek was still alive, was like, okay, I want to be in control of this. If we're going to sell watch, our watches, if we're going to make your watches and sell them, this is the only watch brand you can carry. You have to mm -hmm. cut out all the other Richemont brands. You have to cut out Rolex and get rid of all these relationships. And Tiffany did so because again, they're not a they're not a watch house. They they always they 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 have history about being a watch house and have t close ties with Paddock for a, you know it's the very beginning. But they were like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. We'll get rid of every brand except for Paddock. And the reason for that is they're both very very uh, similar in start. Paddock being from 1930, from 1839, and Tiffany from 1837. They they, they were uh, they they're like around 1851. I think 1851 they they is when they is when they uh, when they partnered, and it was an important <laughs> partnership. If you read Paddock talks about it all the time, it's a huge important partnership for Paddock because Paddock this opens the gateway to the West and spreads them in North America, which is one of their biggest markets outside of China. Mm -hmm. Um, but back then in the 19th century, in 1851, it was a huge, huge part of their business because, I mean, throughout all the, the wars and everything that's happened in our history, um, a lot of brands didn't make it. And Paddock has made it and been successful because in large part, and they owe a large part of it, is to uh, North America. So then, okay, so then Swatch is like, fine, you can keep, tip, you can keep that. Um, and so that makes sense that, you know, Tiffany says we have to keep Paddock. Swatch was like, we get it, fine but you have to get rid of everyone else. So essentially, all these watches that used to be stamped, Bon Mercier, Rolex, and before digital media, we didn't realize the importance of it. I remember working in retail in mid 2000s and people would come in and say, I wanna buy this Bon Mercier Capelin. I don't know if I should buy a Tiffany's that has a stamp. Is it good or bad? I don't know if I want it with the stamp or without the stamp because people actually didn't want the stamp a long time ago. People didn't know. Wow. People were like, I don't want my watch to have the name of retail. Yeah. Right. So it's funny because I remember uh, having a client that was just like, I don't know if I want this watch. I was like, no, buy it for me. <laughs> when I was freaking at the door now. Um, so it wasn't that important until digital media happened and then realized the importance of how few there are. It wasn't until they got rid of all these brands and then only had Paddock. And Paddock was the only company to have this Tiffany stamp for the last like 10 plus years. That kind of makes it so rare and special. I mean, if, you know, if we saw, I don't know, Zodiacs with Tiffany stamps, would we care that much? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, and I say Zodiac because I'm just like looking at like all different brands that we've worked with, Horace mm -hmm. and all the other brands that might be in the lower spectrum. 
um, it, you know, would it would make a difference. So that being said, to know, I'm not sure how much our audience knows, but to give the spiel about what happened with Swatch Group and Tiffany's, they have a huge falling out. Their Swatch so Tiffany's like you're not your watches aren't selling, and Swatch is like you're not selling her watches. Her watches. Even the bad product is just that Tiffany has this huge inflation because of the name and says we're gonna the, the products that they were selling were amazing um but they were too expensive in my opinion they were twice yeah. as much as they should be should be and that was because they can they can command that premium because of the name now yeah. that doesn't necessarily work for watches it works with jewelry but doesn't necessarily work for watches so the watches were a failure they sued each other i think tiffany lost and had to pay 100 million dollars mm -hmm. swatch group exited and tiffany started their own uh, another revamp of their of their watch brand lines that everyone knows now the last couple of years Mm -hmm. um, so all this, put this aside now, now you only have Tiffany's, but you have the, the capability of adding more watches. So now that LVMH owns Tiffany and company, in theory, what's stopping them from saying, hey, now we're going to retail our watches at our giant retailer and we're going to put LVMH, Zenith, Bulgari, all these watches. Why wouldn't they do that? Now, if they yeah. sell them there, why can't they Tiffany stamp them? And if they do that, what does that do to the paddock Tiffany stamp? Is it still special? Is it still important? In theory it is, but- Because it's paddock, but, but but still, if you're paddock, you're saying, I, I kind of lose that luster, that, that, that the, the main thing that, that kind of made this special was it was just you and me, and that was it. If now you add three or four people to the picture, why am I, I'm no longer interested in, in that connection, because what does it do for me? And you also mentioned something, something as well earlier, is the effect that this has had um, on Pateks that are purchased outside of Tiffany. And explain that a little bit more. Um, so there's been talk in the last couple of years because of the rise of social media and digital media and people realizing that they can buy special Tiffany stamp paddocks at Tiffany's, which is technically they can only buy in five stores in the entire world. Mm. They Retailers of paddock, whether they're in Seattle or Bangkok or anywhere in the world has been losing clients because clients aren't dumb. They, they're, they're, they're seeing the, they're watching media and they're watching this stuff. And now they know there's a special version and they're basically getting free money by buying it from that one retailer. Um, it doesn't mean they get it, but it means that they're taking away business now from all the other retailers globally. And there's been talk about how that's been pissing off retailers. Now this is the opportunity for Paddock to say, okay, we don't need to be inside Tiffany's. We're huge. We have, they're closing doors. Rolex and Paddock and every uh, brand has been closing doors and closing distribution, making it smaller and smaller because of the, let's call it the Richard Mille effect, or what used to be the Panerai effect. They used to be, let's have a small amount of distribution, make them really hot, make them desirable. People want them, they can't get them. It's what Rolex has been doing as of recently. Um, but it's also been a combination of like, not whether the brands are doing it on purpose, it's a combination of the demand being so much higher because 10, 15 years ago, the only people who were buying these watches were like 40 and over or very, very few people younger were buying them. And now because of digital and technology, we have a, a, a broader uh, pool of people buying. And that's the reality. And, and, and the, the base of like the, these brands that are selling so much at DAD, they may make more watches, but there's less of them going around. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, it wouldn't surprise me if Paddock said, you know what? Now that you've changed company hands, we're not obligated to, by contract, we can easily take away from Tiffany's, um, which would make the Tiffany stamp watch that already exists super, super rare and very, very valuable. Um, some people would think it's a crazy, um, that'd be a crazy do, a thing to do. But in reality, it's only five doors. They only sell Paddock at five Tiffany doors. It's not a big deal if they took away five doors. Paddock is not going to lose sleep over it, to be honest. They do a lot of business. Don't get me wrong. They do a lot of business at Tiffany's. I was working there for a few years, and I wouldn't be surprised if it were easy to say that, that the Tiffany as a retailer probably sold more Paddocks than any other retailer in the country. I wouldn't be surprised. I saw the numbers. I was there. I, I did the numbers. We sold a lot, probably more than anyone else in the country. Um, maybe out, maybe in the world outside of, you know, Hong Kong. So it's not necessarily the wisest thing to pull out of one of your biggest ADs. Um, but they could say, well, now our brand is going to be sold next to Zenith's and Bulgari's that are Tiffany stamped. They're going to say, do we want one of our biggest competitors to be also one of our retailers? You know, how's that going to affect things? Um, but, uh, I, I just read something Ben said, uh, that there's a possibility Ben, I mean, he was, he mentioned that 
pa- there's speculation. And I heard it. I was at Basel World and SHH. There's speculation of Paddock maybe selling the brand down the line. I thought it. A lot of people thought it when we were down there. It seemed like it was a possibility because I mean, it just seemed like maybe down the line they're going to sell the brand. And who else would they sell it to? But LVMH. 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 Would be nice, but that's too big of a, that's too big of a, a bite. Maybe LVMH could easily easily buy them, and then then they could just keep them at Tiffany's. But you know the value of the brand wouldn't be this wouldn't be there. The same. Um, but it may be if if they had you know if they're if they're joint partners and if LVMH owned both Paddock and Tiffany's, I mean, what are you going to do? I think people are going to forget. I think 10, 20 years on the line, it won't matter. Um, but uh, right now, it would definitely be a blip in history where it's going to influence uh, a huge deal. And, and LVMH is smart. They're not going to just buy Paddock because they can. And Paddock is, is not going to just sell Paddock just to sell Paddock because it's going to have huge implications. And, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very big deal for Paddock to change hands, no matter what. Like, so- Rolex Rol- might be the only brand that could buy them. And people would still be like, okay, I respect the decision. Okay. So let's say... Let's say you're a guy out there. You bought a Nautilus um, 5700. You have the Tiffany & Co. stamp on it. What, what happens to your watch now? Like, what, what do you think? If, let's say, within a few months' time, all of a sudden LVMH makes a decision, Patek leaves Tiffany, what happens now to the value of your watch? If you're lucky enough, if you're one of those few people lucky enough to have, forget just Nautilus. If you're lucky enough to have a, Patek, a Tiffany & Co. Patek, um, so basically what, what I said, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of two things. Either you're going to be super lucky if they pull out of Tiffany's and now you have an extremely rare watch because now the demand's going to be so high and there's no supply because they cut it off. Or the other direction, your watch is going to be as important or as valuable because now they're stamping everything. <laughs> they're stamping Benissimo's and they're stamping, you know, the 386 Revival's edits with Tiffany stamps on them. And that regard i'm assuming the value wouldn't be as high we wouldn't see it immediately but it wouldn't be over time it wouldn't be as important and so uh, that sucks that sucks but to be honest it's 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 kind of it, i don't want to say it's overhyped the, the tiffany stamp isn't overhyped because mm-hmm. it was so important back in 2010 i was just like you don't understand how important this is buy this <laughs> tiffany stamp watch and people are like man i don't want it i got a discount somewhere else and i'm like please buy this for me and they're like man i don't want it i don't care i would have like seven Nautiluses, like eight Nautiluses, steel 5711s, all Sam in my hands. They'd be like, why doesn't anybody want to buy these? <laughs> There's a full story to that because um, the reality was, again, pre-internet, pre all that stuff, mm-hmm. um, it took longer. Uh, so I'm not sure if people, some people are familiar with the process, some people aren't, but the watches get from Geneva, go to each region of the world respectively. And when mm-hmm. they go to the United States, the United States divides that up and sends them to all the retailers. And, and the US has a lot of retailers, right? But this bulk of watches that get sent to the United States and have the SKUs for have the serial numbers for the United States, a mm-hmm. section that goes to Tiffany's, those get set back and everything goes out. Tiffany's watches need to be taken apart, stamped, and then put back together, but they need to be QC'd. And that takes about two weeks. So now wow. everyone who buys a watch at Tiffany's gets their watch two weeks later. So what would happen was people would say, oh, I'm 57. Uh, I call them up, hey, you're on this list. I have a billion names on. Do you, do you want this watch? No, I already bought it somewhere else or you took too long and I bought something else because it would take, we'd get them like, you know, once or twice a year. We're talking about every three, six, six to nine months, we'd get like another batch and maybe we get a handful, but not many. Um, and it would be, uh, you know, it was, it was, people were just like, no, I mean, I already bought it somewhere else because of that delay, which was silly in hindsight. But again, you know, everything's, you know, if we could see the future, we'd all be, you know, more successful. Yeah. So, okay, so now you have the situation, and what do do you think? If you're LVMH, what do you do? You come in, we already talked about Patek and that whole relationship. What do you do with the actual Tiffany & Co. branded watches? Do you continue selling those? Do you use um, the expertise of some of the other brands you have, and you bulk up and make that a better watch? Um, What do you do if you're LVMH? Do you... If you're in your position, I so I'm really excited to see what LVMH does because they've been so under the radar and people don't realize how important, how big, um, and how in, how brilliant they are with their strategy. 
like what they did for Bulgari. Bulgari was like, people didn't care about Bulgari. And Bulgari mm-hmm. had bought Daniel Ross and Gerald Genta. So when they bought Bulgari and they used that Gerald Genta DNA and used the Daniel Ross DNA and then made their own new watches and, and, yeah. and just kept going and kept going, WMA is just fucking brilliant. I mean, yeah. plain and simple, I mean, they knew what they were doing. And it took a couple of years for people to be okay with the Finissimo, yeah. with, with, with a, a Genta-shaped, like Gentas existed and nobody wanted them. Like all the Genta, Genta watches were like, nah, I don't care. And I like, like, if I had the money, I'd buy it. I wish I loved, I loved them. But mm. when Bulgari just put their name on a Genta, it was just like, meh, no one really cared. And then they had to keep like chipping away and, and making it, just refining it and refining it and refining it until it became literally the, the thinnest. The Finissimo. <laughs> the yeah. Finissimo, the finest, thinnest watch in the world and broke record after record after record to build respect. Um, and they did it well. Can they do that with Tiffany's? They can do something similar. I'm not saying they're going to make the world record, but they would be, they're smart enough and have the, the assets available to do something like that. Mm-hmm. So they can easily take Tiffany brand, chuck it, or just start revamping it, um, mm-hmm. which I'm excited to see what they're going to do with it. Because again, it's not a big sector of the money they're going to make. It's, it'd be a tiny sliver, um, but they have the capability to kind of revamp the brand and just and, and make it a winner. Um, like in Bulgari, it's again. That's it's easier said than done. I mean, that's. I mean, they might take what they're already doing. The the Tiffany watches. I may not be the biggest fan, but I met the they're nice watches. The founder. They're not bad. Yeah. The guy's in Lake Como, Italian dude. He's doing it right. Um, the guy who's helping produce and design those. They're not far from where Bulgari is. And if we learned anything from LVMH and Bul- and and just LVMH and their watch department. They and especially Biver, who's you know brilliant. He's a he's a he's a brilliant businessman, and essentially to make them money and save them money, streamlined a lot of the production. So now you have we're in an era now where 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now we'll look back and be like, oh, this is that time where Zenes and Hublot and and all these in Taiwan kind of merged. And just like when you look back, you're like, oh, Whitnauer and Longines were some, you know, they were like kind of joined to the hip at one point in history. Same thing right now. We're seeing that Tag Heuer sort of look like, like, um, like Hublot's and Zenith's look like Hublot's and Zenith and Tag Heuer. There's a Tag Heuer. There's a Zenith that looks like a Tag Heuer. And I'm just like, that is a tech fair with the Zenith movement. And they've actually done that in the past, in the very, very beginning, the acquisition. I remember there was a Zenith movement in a, in a tag lawyer link. And it's just, it's this history that we're going through right now where the three are combined. How is this going to combine, you know, with, with Tiffany's with DNA? Tiffany. Are we going to see streamlined uh, manuf- case manufacturing of Tiffany's watches now instead of maybe outsourcing money and, and all that stuff? So maybe they'll take that and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do something else. Maybe they'll be more of a... Uh, the correlation between Tiffany's watches and uh, and uh, the LVMH like warehouse, like the things they do already. Maybe they'll be looking like Dior. Who knows? But I'm excited to see what LVMH does. Well, Rob, man, uh, you answered all the questions. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a few moments to kind of go over this big news. Uh, tell the people where they can follow you, man. Um, you can find me uh, at Spanish Rob on Instagram and on Facebook. It's SR Horology. Um, obviously follow our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to watch for this channel. Thanks for watching. And, uh, I hope to be on here more often. And, uh, I have a few more interviews and things to, that we got to post up that I've been slacking on. So, uh, I'll post them up. I'll have John, everybody put them up soon. Of course. Guys, yeah. you know, to follow us, watch with us channel on Instagram. We're on YouTube as well. Um, we also have bearded time on Instagram as well. Yeah. But, Rob, thank you so much for coming in from the left coast. It's great talking to you, man. Guys, we'll see you soon. See you there. Bye.